Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you are on the East Coast. I'd like to thank you today for joining us for our webinar, Engaging Children, Interactive Literacy Activities in Preschool and Kindergarten. My name is Sarah Sago, and I am a Deputy Director with the National Center on Improving Literacy. And I'm very pleased to welcome our presenter today, Dr. Elizabeth Grinder. Dr. Elizabeth Grinder has her PhD in Curriculum and Instruction with an emphasis in Early Childhood Education from Penn State University. She currently works at the Goodling Institute for Research in Family Literacy at Penn State and has been working with family literacy programs since 1997. Her work focuses on a number of topics within family literacy programming, including parent leadership, early literacy development, parent involvement, and policy. She is also lead faculty for Penn State's online post-baccalaureate certificate in family literacy. For this certificate, Dr. Grinder teaches early literacy development in the fall and interactive literacy activities and parent involvement supporting academic success in the spring. Welcome, Dr. Grinder. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about interactive literacy. Um, we'll first begin. We'll begin right now. Okay. Um, so this is Family Literacy and the National Center on Improving Literacy, on Improving Literacy. So the nice thing, Family Literacy Day is November 1st, and this is a time to celebrate families reading together at home or in the classroom. But family literacy is much larger than just reading together. It also includes engaging in literacy activities together, talking and engaging in conversations, and going to the library or other places that may have literacy activities. So what is the purpose of family literacy? Really, the purpose is, and the intent behind family literacy, is to break the intergenerational illiteracy and poverty by focusing on the family uh, as a whole rather than the child or adult separately. The bottom line of this holistic approach is to enable children to succeed in school. In fact, the way to break the intergenerational cycle of low literacy is to enable and empower marginally literate parents so that they can foster literacy activities in their at-risk children ages birth to age eight. Parents need to support their children from birth, but it is also critical for parents to support their children in, grade, in school at around grade three, when children are beginning to use reading to learn content, or reading to learn as opposed to learning to read. And the purpose of the National Center on Improving Literacy, well, it has many purposes, but it's primarily to provide families with the information about literacy-related topics, identifying evidence-based literacy instruction, assessment strategies, and accommodation in the meet the needs of children with literacy-related disabilities, including dyslexia. There's a nice marriage between these two, and that's why um, we're gonna go forward and talk about how they can um, be together. So what is, what is family literacy? And I'm gonna start with a little bit of history so we have an understanding of where we are and where it came from. So in the 1980s began the rise of family literacy, where the responsibility of early literacy learning shifted from the schools to the parents. Family literacy supported children's development, especially language and literacy development, which is, which also, while also improving parents' literacy and parenting skills to fulfill their role as the child's first teacher. This was viewed by policymakers as a solution to help children of low literate adults succeed academically. In, 1990, in 1988, Congressman, Congressman William F. Goodling first authorized a demonstration project called the Even Start Program. And the goal of this program was to improve the educational opportunities of children and adults by integrating the areas together into a unified program. In other words, while parents engaged with their children in language and literacy activities, they were also practicing their own language and literacy activities. Family literacy began as a four component model uh, and the foundation of the family literacy programs was the Keenan model. This is a well-known um, four component model that provided services in adult education, early childhood education, interactive literacy activities, or parent and child together time, as it was once known, and parent literacy training that leads to self-sufficiency. When Even Start funding was eliminated in 2011, after steadily, uh, the funding steadily decreased through the years, um, the many uh, states continued to have family literacy. Many family literacy programs still exist through school districts, 
state funding, foundations, libraries, uh, and so on. However, many tend to do more of a three-component model um, where they eliminate the parent education training, which is then subsumed within the adult literacy piece. So let's go to the uh, component of interest, the interactive literacy activities, or as I might refer to them during this, is ILA. Um, the goal of ILA, as it, state, as it says on the PowerPoint, is to improve language and literacy skills, such as speaking, reading, and writing, of children and parents, and to guide parents in understanding the value of positive interactions with their children through play uh, and other activities. Through interactive literacy activities, parents are empowered to make the positive changes in their own lives and the literacy development of their own children. Um, when parents interact with their children, they talk about stories, they talk about um, the pictures and stories, they use touch and feel books, and while they're doing this, children are learning complex oral language structures that help prepare them to learn to read in school. And the nice thing about Isla is while they're doing it, the parents are also um, learning their own literacy skills because family literacy programs tend to serve uh, or are serving adults with literacy needs as well. So what's the research behind um, interactive literacy activities? Well, it, there's been demonstrated consistently a strong correlation between children's academic achievement and the amount of time children and parents spend together doing shared activities. Children, in, in, you know, in addition to the interactions with language and literacy, they're also benefiting from stronger um, emotional and social growth. Um, you know, before children go to school, they need to learn how to read. They need to have some of the skill sets that will lead them on the path to becoming um, good readers. So why is this important to family literacy? Well, interactive literacy activities is considered like the value added component of family literacy because what it's doing is it's unifying the services of parents and children together. Um, it provides learning opportunities for both. Um, often you have a program that's just adult literacy and a program that's just early childhood education and family literacy marries the two and brings the opportunities together for family and children um, to work together. ILA goes way beyond um, a family literacy night or a one-time activity um, because what you're doing with interactive literacy activities is you're providing, you know, long-term um, guidance on how parents and children can interact together. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is based on um, the NCIL brief, Supporting Your Child's Literacy Development at Home. Um, and the focus of this brief is on how parents can help children develop their, children, their child's reading ability, including language skills, fluency, and comprehension skills. The brief goes over three um, age groups and provides suggestions about how parents can interact with these kids in terms of these um, language and literacy skills. Um, with their kids. And there's the URL um, if you're interested in looking it up. But what's interesting is this is, as it says, this is a brief. Um, and so it provides kind of a brief um, information about parents and children engaging together. And it provides really good examples of what to do. But as I, you know, there's, it goes, it, interactive literacy development activities are also um, much broader and can be broader than that. And they can occur in everyday and purposeful activities. Um, and parents should especially, when they're doing them, partner with preschool or elementary school to enhance language and literacy skills taught during the day. So when should um, parents engage in interactive literacy activities? Well, basically, right from birth. Um, a new study presented at the 2017 Pediatric Academic Society demonstrated that reading books with children beginning at infancy boosted their vocabulary and reading skills four years later, and this was before elementary school. And the, what basically the study demonstrated that was beginning to read to very young children has long-lasting effects on language literacy and early reading skills. Okay, um, today we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about basically four uh, areas in language and literacy development. The phonological awareness, alphabet knowledge, fluency and comprehension, and vocabulary development. Uh, these are four areas that are really important as children are beginning to read. So phonological awareness is defined as the ability to identify and play with sound parts in spoken language, um, such as uh, the beginning and end sounds in words, words in sentences, and syllables in words. Phonological awareness is the ability to recognize that words are made up of a variety of sound units. Um, as they begin to learn to read, 
A child understands that words, these small units named phonemes, um, can be broken up into chunks or syllables, and that a syllable begins with a word, uh, begin, excuse me, begins with a sound, which would be onset, and ends with a sound, which is rhyme. So there's a lot of different types of sounds that children are learning about. Why is this important to literacy development? Um, basically, it provides the found, phonological awareness provides the foundation for learning to read. The first step toward learning to read is, is phonics, um, which is the connection between sounds and print letters. And children need to make that connection between these two concepts. And if a child is having trouble, then um, the phonics will um, not come as easily. Okay. Alphabet knowledge is the next area. And this is the ability to name letters and know the letter sounds of the alphabet. Um, basically, alphabet knowledge, is a, and I kind of stated it through the phonological awareness definition, is it's the matching of phonemes, the smallest units of sound, and the respective grapheme, which is the written syllables in language. Um, once children have learned the connection between sounds and print letters and the sounds that make up words, children begin to realize that, that these segments, that they make up the words and they make up letters. So why is alphabet knowledge important? Well, children begin to see that there's a systematic and predictable relationship between written letters and sounds, and this helps them learn how to read. Children are able to blend sounds into a word, so they must match the correct phoneme to the correct grapheme. Without understanding this relationship, children will have difficulty learning to read. They can't, they won't be able to decode words by taking each phoneme and blending them. And if the decoding process is slow or laborious, then this becomes an issue as children are learning, um, learning to read. Fluency and comprehension. Um, the kind of, this is kind of like the next step in learning to read. Fluency, once you have the whole alphabet knowledge and the understanding of words, you have the start of the fluency, which is the ability to read words phrases, sentences, and stories correctly with enough speed and expression. Um, and you have, you know, basically a reading text quickly, accurately, um, and being able to make it interesting to the listener. Comprehension is the ability to understand what you read and what is read to you. You have to be able to listen and understand the text and be able to read and know what you're, what you're reading about. So why is this important? Well, fluent readers, do not have to concentrate to decode words. Rather, they can focus on what the text actually means. A fluent reader uh, groups together words together so that they gain meaning from the text. They are able to connect the ideas in the text using the background knowledge that they may have or the vocabulary. But readers who are not fluent read slowly, word by word. And if a child or a student is spending all of their time to de trying to decode individual words, then they're spending less time, less energy on comprehending what they're reading and comprehending the text. Vocabulary development. So this is an, a final area. This is knowing what word means, what words mean, and how to say and use them correctly. This is kind of the process by which people acquire words. In the, you know, developmentally, infants babble and they begin to hear the sounds and the, and the, and the, of their voices and of parents. And then this progresses to actual words when children are learning and able to blend those sounds together and make the meaning of words. But why is this important? Well, having a rich vocabulary helps children comprehend um, what they've read because they have more background knowledge and understanding of the text. If, if a child doesn't understand the meaning of words, then they can't comprehend the text. And without a sufficient vocabulary, children cannot express their own ideas. They can't write things. You know, the writing becomes harder. Um, so it's a very key piece to um, learning to read and things and learning and uh, comprehension. So what if a child or, uh, has trouble reading? There's reading challenges that are going on. And this is often typified um, more broadly as dyslexia. Um, and parts of, and, and parents need to be able to understand, as well as teachers, of how to detect and listen for struggles of young children while they're learning to read. So if, to define dyslexia, it's described as a brain-based disability that specifically impairs a person's ability to read, um, and that this disability is neuro neurobiological in origin. Basically, dyslexia is a very 
specific learning disability. And what that means is that people, that it, it doesn't affect someone's overall development, rather it's, it um, is a specific narrow, specific narrow area of development. It only has to do with the processing of words. And that's why it's neurobiological in origin, because it's a brain-based disorder. Um, they have trouble recognizing words, and then, as I said, processing the text. Um, and if the, if the brain has trouble with these tasks, the coding inefficiency and fluency and comprehension problems. There are um, many, many people who have dyslexia. It's actually found in every five individuals. And people such as Albert Einstein, Steven Spielberg, Walt Disney, Henry Ford, Whoopi Goldberg, all very creative individuals who have dealt with the challenges of dyslexia. Um, Steven Spielberg only found out um, maybe five to ten years ago that he was dyslexic, and so oftentimes as uh, children are going through school, um, it's not diagnosed, um, and, and they struggle with their reading. So why, and I think we've I've talked about this, is why it's important is basically because of the decoding and processing, uh, reading is not automatic and is labored and very slow. Um, you know, as, we, as I've said, the process is, is, is being able to break down the words into phonemes, the individual words into phonemes. For example, a proficient reader would decode the word bag as b-a-g, uh, bag. But someone who has difficulty decoding may not hear the differentiation in the phonemes. Basically, the three sounds are meaningless when they see the word bag on the page. There are many other skills that are also affected with dyslexia. It can be uh, fluency, uh, excuse me, can be spelling, oral language, writing, self-image, self-esteem. There's many, many things tied up with dyslexia um, and issues around being able to process and decode words. What's interesting about, you know, reading about dyslexia is to read about the facts and myths that, um, that we know about it. So basically, individuals who have dyslexia often are average or above average intelligence. Uh, dyslexia tends to, you know, so you can have a very mild form of dyslexia to go to a very severe where the letters on a page are just a jumble and just are lines and hard, and hard to understand. It tends to be an inherited um, trait. Two children are born with dyslexia, tend to have family members who with this impairment as well. And so a parent may have it, not know they have it, and then their child is also having the same issues reading, and they just think that, oh, I can't read, they can't read, you know. Um, and it can lead to not liking reading, which then is kind of a snowballing effect. Dyslexia can occur in common languages, is common in languages other than English, um, because it is a neurobiological impairment. It has, you know, it has nothing to do with the or the seeing of it. Boys and girls have equal chance of being born with dyslexia. And people as, um, are gifted in other areas that are not language-related, not language-related, such as arts, music, math, sports. And many of the people I listed earlier are um, very strong in those areas. What are some dyslexia myths? Well, you know, one is kids are lazy. Kids are not lazy who have dyslexia. They're doing their best. Um, it takes a lot of energy to go through the day to be always trying to figure out and process what's going on in the reading and the writing. Um, and you've got to think that this is what they're doing in school all day, and it's, you know, so they're having a lot of trouble. So they may act out, there may be other symptoms of what's going on um, if a child has dyslexia. Uh, another myth is it's visual perceptual deficit. And as we said, no, it's neuro, neurobiological. Um, it's at the processing level, as the phonemes, not at the visual processing level. A survey was done um, about asking teachers about, yeah, I think it was in Illinois, and 74% of the teachers incorrectly believed that letter reversal was the main criteria for diagnosing dyslexia rather than phonologically based. Um, and the switching of letters is very common in the early stages of learning to read for all children not just children with dyslexia. So using that as a criteria um, is not correct. Uh, the also in the same survey, survey, an overwhelming majority of the teachers believe that colored overlays and or tinted lenses would help individuals with dyslexia. And this also you know, falls within the belief that it's a visual perceptual deficit, which it is not. 
Another myth is children with dyslexia will never learn to read. And this is not true because if they have found that if it's diagnosed very early, um, you know, the less, the less severe the problems become over time. And if children are given systematic and pur purposeful instruction, then they're able to overcome a lot of the, prob the issues related to dyslexia. For example, systematic, maybe you teach the same method, the same system for many different concepts. So it's systematic and we can understand that one way and intentional or purposeful means you're just, you're intentionally teaching about a particular um, sound or something. Okay. Um, you want no, if there's, you want more information about uh, the dyslexia, then the NCIL also has a brief called Dys Defining Dyslexia and other information about dyslexia on their website. So it's a good resource to go um, look at. Okay, so now the time, finally, for talking about interactive literacy activities with of what parents can do um, in terms of helping their children with their reading skill, language and literacy skill development. I've provided a background in the areas of language and literacy, which we're going to talk about in terms of interactive literacy activities, a little bit about the dyslexia. So as you know, we, I talk about the interactive literacy activities as they relate. Uh, these are also in, intended for and they can help kids with dyslexia or kids without it because the stronger the foundation and phonological awareness, the more success a child will have as they learn to read. So what can parents do? Um, and this is particularly important in preschool and kindergarten for parents to engage in the interactive literacy activity as to help, as I said, for them to gain and acquire these skills. And one thing I said, as I said about intentional and explicit, uh, in your play or your activities with your child, with the parent, with their child, um, especially about interacting about phonological awareness. And this can relate, uh, particularly as it relates to rhyme or working with syllables or talking about the onset, the beginning sounds of words or rhyme or the end of words, and to be definite and, and explicit and intentional about talking about that part of the word. It's also important to make sure that it's fun because you don't want your child uh, to dread playing, you know, talking about words and word sounds and you don't want to make it a drill game and, a, you know, flashcards. You want it to be fun and make the, the, what you're doing with words and how you're interacting with words is something that they want to play with and do uh, themselves. You want to engage in lots of wordplay, lots and lots of wordplay, such as rhyming, singing songs, reading poems. And the wonderful thing about playing with words and the whole phonological piece is this is really something that can begin at birth. I mean, you can read, of course, at birth, but you're singing your songs, you're doing rhyming games. Um, it's great for children from very, very young age to hear the nuances and the subtleties of um, the sounds of words. You can sing songs where children have to fill in the blank of a rhyming word, such as, if you know of it, Down by the Bay, um, or manipulate sounds such as the song Apples and Bananas, um, which my children knew when uh, the singer Raffi sang them, and they loved to sing the songs and add their own funny, exaggerated rhyming words with them. You can also play games that isolate and exaggerate songs, sounds such as tongue twisters, and this is also called alliteration, where all the words have start with the same sound, such as in a book that's really great for this is Sheep in a Shop, um, or, you know, Sally Sat Sideways on the Seesaw, so you can make up your own silly tongue twisters, um, or take, make up, take up time, you know, making rhyming words, um, throughout the day, if you're in the car, going around, I mean, there's lots of fun ways to really make the enunciation and the, um, and the uh, working with the sounds of words. More on phonological awareness. So you can also read books that focus on words by sound, such as One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, lots of rhyming sounds in that. Another Nancy Shaw book would be Sheep in a Jeep, um, which is quite hilarious, or Is Your Mama a Llama? Uh, these are all really fun books to really the, um, to talk about the sounds and the rhyming of words. And when you're reading the books, don't focus on the sounds as opposed to the written word or letter. What you can do is get the child to be exposed to what the sounds mean. And once they have the sounds down, which we'll get to in a minute, then you start making that connection to the letter. 
And then you can ask questions about sounds while you're reading books, such as what sounds do most of the words end with? Or what sounds can we make with the words? Or where do you hear the b sound for the letter B? Um, and such books might be Bear Snores On or Down by the Cool of the Pool, and, uh, which are a couple of really good books um, that work on the sounds. Oops. Um, there we go. Um, and then the last little things of phonological awareness is to engage in word play during everyday activities, such as going to the grocery store. I mean, when you're in the vegetable section, you say, what sound does the word carrot begin with? Or um, uh, everyday activities, if you're out walking, uh, talking about silly words or making rhyming words while you walk or finding rhyming words in the, in the you know, trees and bees. You could play syllable games or read books with a strong rhythm, like Silly Sally by Audra Wood, or We're Going on a Bear Hunt by Michael Rosen, which is a great fun book my children loved. Um, they, what you do is you, you, know, you clap out the syllables as you're reading them, or you, make, you know, make the sound so that they can hear the rhythm within the words. Or you can also sort out um, pictures by the number of syllables, match pairs that rhymes or have the same beginning sound if you have, um, you know, words or letters or create, you know, create, create pictures of them. You get them from magazines. And then finally, you can find a computer software that focuses on developing phon phonological or phonemic awareness skills. There are so many programs out there now that are engaging and colorful that can keep young children motivated while ha still having fun. And you have to make sure that, it's, that, it, that it is a good app and not um, something to just keep them busy um, that's just kind of flashy things, but more that really hones in on the skills of the sounds of letters and phonological awareness. The alphabet knowledge and literacy, or, uh, an alphabet knowledge and interactive literacy activities, what might these involve? So as children develop, we, you know, we've talked about phonological awareness where they need to make connections, you know, about the sounds and things. And now for alphabet knowledge, they begin to make that connection between the phoneme and the grapheme or the printed letter or the, what, or the symbol. And letters are the, build, the building blocks of words. So they, once you feel comfortable that they have the phonemes, you know, then it's time to start making that connection. And what can parents do? And as it was with phonological awareness, you make it fun. Um, make it fun games so that it's not a chore. The kids don't know, dread having to do that. You play with words and letter sounds. Um, they help your child learn the alphabet, um, you know, with phonological awareness. Making letters such as with paints or Play-Doh or whipped cream. When it's infants and toddlers, whipped cream is great because they can, if it's on their hands, they can eat it, it won't matter, but they can start, you know, kind of making the letters. Um, make alphabet books together where, you know, maybe this takes over time, um, where you find magazines or you take photographs of, I was going on your walk, you take photographs of words that may begin with a certain sound or a certain letter, and then you create that book over time, and it's a, you know, it's a wonderful way, and then you can go back and read that book together because you will, will have made it together. Um, provide alphabet puzzles and magnetic letters. So this allows you know, the puzzles where they can start matching up the sound. You could say the sound, and then they, put the, they make the puzzle with it um, with the magnetic letter. You play the game Hide the Letter. And this, you print letters on cards, or you use Scrabble letters, or you find plastic letters, and you say, I've hidden the letter B. Can you find it? Or the letter W is by the sink near water. Can you find it? So you play different games like that. Or the ultimate favorite book or game that I played with my kids was I Spy, focusing on letters. Instead of I Spy a piano, you say I Spy um, something that begins with the letter D and they may see a dog. And so you can play um, instead of making it um, objects. Um, you can also read alphabet books together, uh, which is great fun. You have the one you made, or you can read one together that's already written, such as Alphabet City by Stephen Johnson. This is alphabet letters are embedded in realistic illustrations of city scenes. And it's fun to go through the, the pictures and try to find the letters. Um, and you can play I Spy as you're doing, as you're reading the book together. Um, another book is the, the Butterfly Alphabet book. 
um, where this book features photographs of butterflies with alphabet letters in their wings. This may be more for kids who know their letters a little bit better because sometimes the letters are not clear or they're a little bit distorted, but um, it's very, it's a fun, beautiful pictures of um, butterfly books. And then one that's particularly fun is Q is for duck, an alphabet guessing game. Uh, and this is a twist on a traditional alphabet book where Q is for duck. And you know why? Because the duck says quack. So, and there's other ways they do this. So it's a great fun to do. And then there's the, always the alphabet apps or online resources to help with the alphabet knowledge. So once kids have grasped, you know, some of the words and they know their alphabet, you can start working on fluency and comprehension activities, um, interactive literacy activities. And this maybe tend to be for older kids, but if you do with younger kids who are not quite reading, it can be listening comprehension, which is equally important as you're reading a story to them. Um, Sit with your child and read. Um, again, read together every day and take turns reading out loud. If your child is able to read, then you, you model the reading first. What, it, what fluent with expressions, um, you know, flow, uh, the, the words go together, flow together. You model this um, type of reading and then have your child repeat the same page so that they can um, uh, read how you have done it. Reread favorite books. Uh, this way your child can practice reading familiar books. Um, each reading, after reading it over and over again, it becomes a bit easier and a bit faster, and there's more confidence in expression as, the, as they're reading. So it's a lot more fun. Read poems together. Short, these are, contain, poems tend to contain short passages, and they also contain rhyme, rhythm, and meaning, and you can talk about the meaning in the poems, and it can talk about many social development or a lot of different things, and, and poems can be silly. You can make silly words with them, so that can be a lot of fun. And the real way, and, and you know, one of the ways that is often done in school is you ask questions about the, um, or the text for the story. Who is telling the story? Where does the story take place? Tell me what happened in the story. Um, what do you think the author wants you to know after reading the book? So there are many different ways and different questions to ask about them. And when you're asking the questions, you want them to be open-ended questions where uh, your child has to think about the answer as opposed to a closed question, which is, you know, for example, what color is a balloon? You know, the answer is either it's a color. And then there are other sort of connections you can make uh, or other things you can do. It's start, you know, ask questions that make connections to their own, the child's own life experiences. You know, if it's a book about, um, you know, are going or seeing going outside and say, hey, do you remember when we went hiking? And then they can start reflecting and talking about that. Or you make predictions before you read the book and before and while and after you read the book um, about what the story might be about from the pictures and things like that. And then you ask, and, and the really tough one is inferential questions, you know, you know, why do you think the author chose to have the story take place here? All right, so then there's vocabulary development, interactive literacy activities. And as I've said for the other three, have fun. Make it fun. Um, when you're reading aloud, all the other activities we've talked about, reading aloud, having conversations, you know, talking about parts of words and the sounds, all of this increases children's vocabulary. Um, you want to talk about different words in the story before reading, maybe go through it and say, hey, or while you're reading, say, what do you think this means? How, you know, after they read the sentence and they can get the meaning from the context of the sentence. Or um, you talk about different, yeah, we talk about different words. Or you label objects in the house, and that's another way for vocabulary development. Put little signs all over all the different things in your house and a child can then make that connection between the object and um, the words. Engage in conversation with descriptive words of names of objects. Um, you know, for example, if they choose something, you say, oh, I use chosen that, and look, it's the color green, or your hands are small, my hands are big. So you make, you, uh, you kind of scaffold or make the sentences a little bit larger for them to help them learn about um, more words. And then you model questions and curiosity about words. You know, ask the questions of children of what do you think that word means, or let me tell you about a word I just learned. Or promote the curiosity of words, and then you praise children when they ask about a word that they don't know, um, so that they know that it's okay to ask what words mean and things. 
Okay, so there are lots of other resources out there for interactive literacy activities. Um, for example, they, we have, um, at the Goodling Institute, we have resources called Be Excited About Reading Activities, BEAR, we call them BEAR activities. And these provide um, activities such as before, before during, and after uh, what a parent might do with their child. They'd have to go to the library and get the book, and it says, you know, these are sort of questions you might ask about a book. Um, what does the cover say? You know, look, where's the author? And then you ask questions about, you know, give suggestions about what kind of questions or what you might do while reading the book. And then you have, then there's different about what to do after the book, which relate to the story. Um, and then there's also um, suggestions about other books that are similar to that book, but they're wonderful kind of ways to um, engage in interactive literacy activities that are kind of all set up for the parent. There's also the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, which is also at Penn State University. And these, they have um, wonderful books that have interactive literacy activities as well that show examples of how to um, engage in children with activities. And then there's the Smithsonian Learning Lab, which uh, is, is a really great resource which can provide ways of how to make books from things in the Smithsonian collection or works of art, or it's just a, a wonderful sort of resource to kind of explore things um, about um, objects and making, making stories. And then Reading Rockets is a great resource for all different things about reading and par there's parent suggestions and there's teacher suggestions and there's information about um, what is dyslexia and reading difficulties and there's videos from very from well-known people who about who know so much about these topics so it's a great resource and then there's PBS parents which also provides great activities for um, parents and children to do together oops skip to page um, this is the bibliography, just some suggestions of information which I used in the presentation. And um, if you have, would like to contact me, uh, please feel free to. I can provide you information more about the Bear Books or information about this PowerPoint, um, this present, this webinar, or I can provide you information about the Family Literacy Certificate. Feel free to call me. Um, thank you for attending this webinar. Okay, um, I hope that I don't sound really weird because I had a, an issue with my uh, audio. So um, I am going to uh, open up questions and let me see what I've got here. Okay. Um, The first question is, how do I respond when my child makes a mistake? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, because that happens as children are learning to read, that's going to probably happen a lot. Um, because they're learning, they're learning things. I mean, nobody's obviously going to learn how to read with no mistakes. But really what you need to look at is what kind of mistakes are um, is the child making? Are they mistakes that affect, um, are, they, are they mistakes that make sense? Um, so if you have mistakes that don't affect the meaning of a sentence, for example, they skip a word or they substitute another word for another, then those are not um, as bad. They're because you're, those are natural mistakes that a child will make as they're learning how to read. But if there are mistakes that don't make sense, which really affect the meaning of the sentence, for example, if a child uses the word monkey instead of the word money, then these are mistakes that um, a, a parent might or a teacher might want to want to correct. Um, but what you don't want to correct it right as they're right as they're reading, right as soon as they make the mistake, but allow them to finish the reading and see that they don't they realize that it doesn't make sense that monkey and money. Oh, that really that word doesn't make sense at all. So that they begin to find the mistakes themselves. Um, and they can correct it on their own. Okay, great, thank you. And the next question we have is, I'm not the strongest reader myself. Are there other ways to engage my child with a book? Another great question. 
Um, and this is, you know, there are many, many parents who aren't strong readers, and particularly in family literacy programs, because as I said, family literacy programs, the parent and the child are, both have a literacy deed, so they're both trying, you know, learning how to read to get, learn to read at the same time. And that's what's so wonderful about interactive literacy activities is because both the parent and child can benefit from um, reading books together. And one of the most important things is really to be comfortable and have a really, and, and it's a time for parent and child to be close and enjoy each other's company. But as you're reading, um, pick books that are not, start out with books that aren't very complicated, that maybe have a lot of pictures pictures that encourage conversation. Or, you know, if you see, a, you know, a picture in the book, you could still figure out what are rhyming words with the tree. Um, so there are, you know, you can still have the conversations and you can figure out words together. Um, or another great thing is to have wordless picture books um, where you can, you don't, you start out with not having the words and this would be the beginning of conversations um, and being able to, um, talk through the story and make up your own story as you're going along. And again, that allows conversations and hearing the sounds of words and doing all these things. So it's um, a really nice opportunity. Great. So um, next question, how do I know what letters or sounds I should focus on with my child? Well, um, that, you know, that's kind of a little bit up for debate, but we'll start out with the, you know, there are many letters that make kind of make sense to start with. Uh, for example, like consonants, which my, that you can stretch and pronounce and kind of play with like M and F and S because you can stretch them and you can do all different things with them. Um, and that, which is a lot of fun. And then you might move to consonants such as a T or P. Um, and when you get to vowels, you might start with long vowels because they are easier to say. But, um, you know, when you think about it, a lot of short words uh, have a short vowel sound. So you've kind of got to um, figure out which, which works best. Um, but children really need to understand how the mouth moves when you say a letter like M or N. You know, how is the mouth moving to make this particular word? So this is a really good time to practice the alliteration or the tongue twisters. So when you say, for example, the letter N, my neighbor Nancy was nice to Nick, you can see that the letter, how the letter N is said um, consistently with the same mouth moves so they can get practicing with them. And then once the letter sounds are accomplished or um, they understand them, then that begins the relationship of the phonics and um, the letters and sounds together. All right, great. Um, I think that that is all of the questions we have. So um, I just would like to thank you, Dr. Grinder, for uh, joining us today and um, giving us a little more information um, about interactive literacy activities. Thank you. National Center on Improving Literacy. The research reported here is funded by awards to the National Center on Improving Literacy from the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education in partnership with the Office of Special Education Programs, award number S283D160003. The opinions expressed are those of the authors and do not represent views of OESE, OSEP, or the U.S. Department of Education. Copyright National Center on Improving Literacy.